Let's hop into it. I had some questions about my own history over the years, and I think that we're all at a point in time where we need to learn how do we love ourselves? It's really easy to get caught up in all the things of the world and to think that we are the only one going through the things that we are going through or that no one understands us. And to be fair, every single person on this planet, over 8 billion of us humans, we all have very unique ways of being. So I'm passionate about unlocking and exploring and becoming a part of this adventure that is my DNA. And this all began early in my childhood. And if you've tuned in before to our other programs and our other Educator Aid sponsored workshops, et cetera, then you know I'm passionate about bringing together people who are third culture kids. And essentially what that means is you are raised in a very bicultural home. This can apply to so many things, right? Because culture is influenced by environment, by factors like religious beliefs, um, the, the socio-political construct that you're born into, all of these different systems that already we are born into in this world, often these things don't account for nuance um, or what could be predicted, you know, hundreds of years in the future. And now you have those who are millennials like myself as well as younger generations where it's much more common and you often might hear somebody say, oh, you're a mutt or I'm a mutt. And what they mean, right, a dog that's a mutt, often you might not know its origins or you might not be clear on the origins. You might have some idea and see certain features or nuances about that breed, for example, but you might not know exactly the origin. And what happens to us as humans when we hear things about, hey, you should really love yourself. And uh, that's a little tricky when I'm not really even sure where I'm from or what is running through my blood, literally, even at a biological level. So ever since I'm a kid, you know, growing up in this atmosphere of Amish and Mennonite on my mother's side, and then on my paternal side, my father's side, Puerto Rican, as well as having a grandmother who was an orphan along the way. Um, my paternal grandmother actually holds a lot of Scottish, Greek, and Cherokee roots, some indigenous roots to the North, to North America. But because she was an orphan, um, and also learned the language, married my grandfather who came to Chicago from Puerto Rico when he was about 16. Um, there's so many levels and layers, right? So as, because the United States, for example, I'm a United States citizen, I'm a resident here, was born and raised here. When you are born, your nationality in the country you're in, often it's not accounted for outside of that. Many people might identify as American or Mexican or Puerto Rican, those are nationalities. That's your country of origin. That isn't necessarily indicative of where all of your bloodlines, your DNA, what is pumping through your heart and soul, your makeup of who you are, your culture, your personality, so many intricate things held in our DNA. None of that is by mistake. I think it's by divine design personally. I think these things are all interconnected. But I'm, I'm here because I want us to dive into what does that journey look like for you? And I want to share one tool that's helped me on that. So because I come from a very large extended family, it's still very shocking for people in the United States and even around the world to go Amish, which is really Swiss, German, um, and a lot of Swedish. I have Swedish roots, Finnish roots, that whole region uh, it just depends on where it's traced to along the way that something that my parents really fostered in myself and my siblings growing up was that number one, we were children of God. So I grew up in a very religious home, but I'm saying all this to say, I see so many of us, especially those who are 40 and under in the United States who struggle with identity and understanding not only who we are, but how to love ourselves. Because when I'm told, you know, self-love, self-love, self-care. I think for many years of my life, that didn't resonate with me because I didn't really know myself well enough to really know how to step into my power or love myself. And you realize over time and as you grow older and you have different experiences in your life, just depends on your life path, 
you might have these realizations of, of this knowingness or this longing of knowing that you're connected with other things in the earth or on the globe outside of the city or the town that you happen to be living in or even the country. Um, so I say that to share with you, one of the tools that I've employed is using different genealogical tracing tests as well as building a family tree. So I will give a disclaimer. I consider myself a very amateur genealogist. I am not an amateur researcher and data analysis person, data analyst, from a metrics and those types of things and building systems in that way through an education lens. That's a lot of my background and even things that I implemented and built over time with my consulting firm for the past seven years. But I am not, I am not an expert genealogist. So please, if you see this and you have any tips or tricks or hints or things that I don't know, please put it in the comments so we can share with our community here on Love Learning You. Now, we are not sponsored yet by Ancestry DNA, but I will tell you they are one of my favorites thus far. There are definitely many, many, many other routes you can go, especially if you are trying to trace indigenous lineages and indigenous heritage places that are connected to you. There are lots of very specific sites for that. Um, so there's one specific site that I went to to specifically trace different um, Jewish tribes that my bloodlines were affiliated with and that my DNA holds. So that's just one particular people group. So because I have a unique situation with being a third culture kid and my panel came back as representing enough significant blood from 15 different ethnic groups in the world. Um, I grew up very much identifying and being proud, especially from my dad there that you see Pablo Gonzalez on my tree feeling very proud of being Puerto Rican and knowing that was special, not always knowing what that meant or what it could mean or what it does mean in the future or anything like that, but knowing that that was something to be proud of. And likewise with my mom, may she rest in power. Um, she, the, the Amish and Mennonite tradition have a very well-documented written history of their lineage. So even down to going to family reunions when we were growing up, we would have hundreds of relatives there. So both sides of my family, very big, very large. This might be different than your situation. And it might be even easier for you to do this work that I'm about to show you that I've been putting in now for a couple years um, it, as a way to not only trace my roots and heritage, but it's just a passion I enjoy. It's a hobby I enjoy. They have an intuitive app. They have just released even extra fact checking as far as checking public documents and census records to check your family tree records. Where you do run into issues and where there's still going to be bias is the fact that when you come from indigenous bloodlines and or you have in your family people who were enslaved Africans or people who lost their identity through systems of oppression, then some of those documents aren't accurate. And obviously that doesn't trace back to knowing like perhaps family names from a system like this. That's where you might look into more intricate, into African archives, Jewish archives, different things like that, um, Native American or American Indian, different terminology you can use there that's acceptable. But those things all exist because that helps you get more granular. I would consider ancestry a way to be more broad and get you excited and learning about the regions that you come from and what connects with you. There's going to be certain areas of the world that maybe just naturally you feel more at home with and more parts of your bloodlines that you feel more connected with. That's okay. But if we just sit and don't explore and we say, I'm American or I'm Mexican or whatever country we happen to be born in, that's not always accurate to where we feel like we belong and where we could thrive the best. And so I point this out to you. I do need to update these pictures. I realize my hair is quite different now, <laughs> but um, I want to show you the magnitude because at this point, um, it gets a little spotty with certain bloodlines. And, you know, one of the things too you have to be prepared for is if your family is not super open over the years with um, family stories, <laughs> you might also uncover many like mysteries or hidden stories or long lost relatives that were from here or from there. 
Um, and that is partly because of the times and how things were designed to keep things hidden. Information, because we have the internet and we have this connectability with so many people, it, this is, we are in an age where why not? Why would we not trace our heritage and know the DNA and the blood pumping through us and where we can connect and where we feel like we can start to know more of who we are and where we come from? I have heard people talk about 23andMe and because that, I guess, gives more of a health type panel. I've had cousins who have done that. I will say in comparison, when I saw their reports, I even saw my grandparents' breakdowns. Ancestry was much more specific with being able to identify. They have a much larger set of DNA globally, I feel like, um, and they've been around long standing. as far as really having enough sample size to say, yep, we can whittle you down to this region based on all the amounts of the blood that we have from DNA in that part of the world, in that region. So you see here on both sides, this can go so far. And you can keep going and going, going. I think the furthest I traced both sides was back to around the 1200s at this point. But when you're in here building your tree, the really cool thing is you're going to be able to find some level of public documents. For example, we find Raymond Wood. He was my biological great grandfather. My grandmother never knew him. She was an orphan. But you see here what he appears like, who he looks like, all of the things and his name. You all I could also find. And this was this was huge for me because this was actually just a couple of years ago when I started diving into this further as far as building out the tree. I've been in ancestry for over 10 years, but then building out my tree became more persistent after my mother passed away. It was something she was passionate about with her side of the family. Um, so I've wanted to do that comprehensively. So I can know as much about both sides as possible and have my own experiences and own learned understanding and connecting points, not just relying on the stories and words of other family members, but to also then reach out, look at these documents, reconnect with cousins. Um, I, I found a lot of different people on here I can connect with. So it's pretty cool um, what you can find. But the thing that I found interesting was once again, I had never seen a picture of him. He actually looks exactly like one of my uncles. You can tell clearly that he is was mixed with American Indian. Um, but then also, I know that also from the documents, not just saying that because you should never judge just by how somebody looks. You cannot judge just by how somebody looks. What you're seeing is a beta where they've also done Ask Ancestry AI. And that is where they're doing a cross check of your family tree and the documents that are on public record. What I found out at the time that was shocking because they build the timelines for you, they correct them, and you actually are going through. You are becoming the person that says, hey, this looks accurate. This is what I know to be true. He was married to this person. He lived here. Okay, yes, this document. Yeah, that's when he enlisted in the war, blah, blah, blah. You have to take time going and fact checking those things. That's been many, many hours for me, but it's also been very fun. Um, so all that to say, what I found out is the reason why I had never heard anything about him, and often we didn't know, so you see here, I'm giving you this kind of tour, is because he was shot and killed, and it was an unsolved murder. It's still an unsolved murder to this day, and he was found on the side of the road in uh, near Appalachia. That is where part of my heritage comes from, is from Appalachia there in that area. So this was knowledge to me that I had never known in my life until two years ago but it's actually public record and it's out there. So I think when we live in a time like this where we have access to so much information, what are we choosing to do with that information? And are we using it to go on and get um, all up in arms because a family member said something on Facebook about a politician? Or are we, are we out here trying to learn about how to love ourselves better so that we can love others better? Um, so you see that it's a pretty intuitive tool. I have to zoom in and show you my grandma now that I spoke about her. I actually just gave a talk about her a couple of weeks ago because she's a huge inspiration, Miss Phyllis. That is my grandmother. So anyways, it, it, you become what I realized in this process, especially because we recently we recently all experienced a global pandemic and we still often are feeling the effects of that. Um, 
I see people really yearning to belong. And I don't think that's new after post pandemic or anything like that. I think it's something I've always felt. I've um, seen a lot of Puerto Ricans conversing about this over the years because we often have felt that identity. Um, if you're part of the diaspora like I am, or you've been on the island, or you're a new Eurekan or whatever, I think that is part of that mystery because we know as Puerto Ricans, we come in all shapes, sizes, shades, and colors. But what does that really mean? And where do those lines come from? Because many of us know if you are Puerto Rican, you often hold Taino, which is indigenous people of Puerto Rico and Dominican, that area. You often hold Taino as well as Spanish uh, colonizer, as well as African blood. So many people don't know that, uh, depending on how your appearance and your features and how things show up, what else you're mixed with, all those things. So we can never make these broad assumptions. And I think we are moving out of that way of trying to put people in boxes. It, it can't happen anymore. And so what else do we have to rely on? Not what other people tell you you should be. No, you have to go out there and start to love learning you and figure out who you are, where you come from, et cetera. This is one tool that I used to do that and that I have found to be really, really helpful. I'd love to know in the comments some other journeys from people and let's start to share. Let's share how have you started love learning, loving to learn you. We're going to dive into so many more topics in these short teaching videos about loving learning you. So make sure that you're following us on TikTok and YouTube. We're at Love Learning You. This is an at Educator Aid sponsored learning resource as always from our team here. So you might see some other faces be joining the content over time with the Love Learning You um, videos here and on TikTok, uh, YouTube and TikTok specifically. So if you're not and you're seeing this elsewhere, make sure you hit subscribe or follow on those preferred platforms. We also still have our monthly featured voices, cultural capacity episodes, and where we're still diving into understanding how we connect and create with others and how we communicate cross-culturally, learning through the stories and lived experiences of others. So you'll want to be sure you're subscribed, especially to YouTube, because that's where those air. Um, so thank you for tuning in again on your preferred podcast platform. You'll be hearing these audio. Um, but for sure, if you'd like to see the video and how I was sharing how you can navigate on Ancestry, we might also do follow-ups. So if you like this and you want further, they are so much. And clearly that took a lot of time um, for me to build out my tree um, to go back to the 12, 1300s and stuff. It is tedious and it's time consuming. And also it's been an incredible journey. And I realized, um, kind of going back full circle to what I was saying a little bit ago, I realized post-pandemic, because I think we all kind of have hit and I think it's still happening. We're like, I'm done with the algorithms. I'm done with, you know, social media trying to dictate what they think I want to see or whatever. And then it's okay. I'm on social media because I enjoy it. I like creating. I like putting content out there. But I also know that it really causes extra stress levels for people, even if you're subconscious and you haven't really registered that. And I started thinking to myself, man, imagine if I spent as much time as I do on social media becoming like obsessed with learning me what if I became obsessed with learning me and understanding me and understanding how I operate and how I love and re give and receive love that is what actually will continue to evolve and change and grow our world is if we all consistently say how do I best know the best version of me that I want to be the way that I want to show up how do I understand and love me because if I don't do those things, I absolutely am not going to be able to do it well with other people. Um, so take care and let's continue to get compassionately curious together. <laughs>